All right, we are live. Okay. Hurry Hello, for humans. What the? Uh, hmm. What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Are you, we're, we're live. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do seven things at the same time. Uh, and Google Drive is not loading for me. Maybe that's maybe that's what's causing the, yeah, something's maybe it's Google Drive is is messing up my account. Yeah, I bet that's what's going on. Google's having issues because your green bars to me, and I can't get into Google Drive. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. It is a bad day for the internet. Yeah. Okay. Weird. Okay. All right. You know, I'm just gonna, just gonna, we're just gonna soldier on. We uh, are. How's it going? It's it's going okay. Other than the, I'm allergic to the handles on my bicycle, and my gloves weren't thick enough, so my hands hurt. So, um, oh no. Yeah, like my hands are really swollen. Like you can see on my wedding band. Like, yeah, that's not normal. And my face is swollen, and I'm sure other things. And that's are just swollen. from the handles of your bicycle. Yeah. And normally you wear gloves because you know this is a problem. Right, but I I went on the longest ride that I've gone on so far, and apparently rubber particles just came through the gloves so i'm gonna have to switch from the the ones that i'm using to ones that are more robust and or like change out the handles i haven't found any for this bike yet that aren't rubber and it's has me annoyed like you could probably get leather yeah i need to see yeah that's funny and terrifying yeah yeah, like, like not we, funny, haha, -ha, funny, peculiar. Yeah, we we uh, went out for uh, we went to the brewery last night and got wings and beers and bike rode there and bike rode home and it was glorious and my hands today are like we regret every decision you made. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, or like wrapping, like you can like like I used to like on my mountain bike I would like. Mm -hmm put a wrap it's almost like a like a tape for like a hockey stick tape and you just you'd wrap it around and around and around and around and around and yeah. around and i have that on it. my racing bike made out of cork. yeah 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 but like my city cruiser just has those like stabiani cork. ones cork 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 that's yeah. it you, you've got like a city cruiser right yeah yeah cork handles cork bike grips yeah some pretty cool ones okay i will yeah, go looking set. after this episode yeah. cork yeah that's the that's the machine okay now you i mean you're gonna want to see if they have any rubber in them yeah because often that's, it's like rubber is binding them together that's often the problem mm Hmm. but leather's a good idea too yeah huh okay it's just All right. the stupidest of problems <laughs> Yeah, totally. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, what did we do you write here? your intro in something other than Google Drive? Uh, I intro? always write my intro in Trello. Okay, so then we're fine. All yeah. right. I didn't know what I I have no way right now of acknowledging our patrons, other than to say I love them and Google doesn't. <laughs> right. So you'll have to like record something afterwards. All right. Okay. Are you ready to I'm begin? I'm going to ask, what's the question I ask 90% of the time? 684. Thank you. All right. I am resizing the window and pressing record there. And I'm pressing record there, and record has been pressed. Uh, okay, I've also pressed record. Here we go. 
Astronomy Cast, episodes 684, Too Big, Too Soon, Massive Early Galaxies Defy Expectations. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, a weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Professor Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. I, I love the fact that you can say that exactly the same every single time. It's it's delightful. Right. I'm except just reading you, from a script. Except you said episodes, and I love that the content for this singular episode is so great that it needs to be referred to as a plural. Did I say episode 684? You, you did. Well, it was delightful. Well, you, but, uh, but episode, episode 684, episodes 684. No, like... I said episode. <laughs> it's just that it, it just, the way I say it is exactly the same. <laughs> um, so we, I, I've been playing with the Merlin app, which is this bird app uh -huh. that you can get and install on your phone. And it lets you like report sightings and it's great for ornithologists to be able to count birds and so on. And the, the, has a gadget that you put onto it uh, that will do recording sounds. Yeah. And so you just put it outside and you listen for bird sounds. And then they just, as it hears a bird, it just adds it to this database in front of you. Oh, wow. And so you're, you're hearing these birds sing all around you and you're like, oh, that's a chickadee. Oh, that's a junco. Oh, that's a towhee. And, and then you get rare birds too. And oh, I, cool. I had so much fun. And then... And what's been amazing is, is that now we're starting to hear these birds and we look, you know, we've like, oh, there's a tanager and I've never seen a tanager, never heard of a tanager before. And then you look up pictures, you're like, what a great bird. And then suddenly a couple of days later, you see the bird <laughs> and you're it's like, that's a tanager. <laughs> like, he landed on our fence and Carl and I were both just like watching him, just oohing and aahing at this beautiful bird, beautiful, oh, bright amazing. orange, yellow, like a, like a tropical bird, but in in the temperate rainforest. So um, I, I highly recommend this, this app. If you are interested in birds at all, the, it's called uh, Merlin and it just, it's just, it's so much fun. And then find some friend to get into out birdsmanship with. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're just like, oh, you know, my life list is 57 birds. My life list is 76 <laughs> birds. So highly recommend it. That that is that is absolutely amazing. We we actually uh, here in Edwardsville were able to accidentally prove a research paper. I read a paper a number of years ago about how songbirds are less likely to live near busy streets because their song gets drowned out. Hmm. And I have an identical bird feeder to one of my friends who recently moved to town. And she lives far enough back from all of the busy roads in this super quiet little neighborhood that backs up on the high school. And she gets songbirds all the time. And I never get any songbirds. And we're mm. two miles apart. And the only difference in our neighborhoods is how busy the streets are. And uh, so it's weird just how localized things like that have allowed research to be done. And now we're like seeing yeah. the results proved out. It's cool. Theory proved. That's amazing. Yeah. One of JWST's top jobs is to peer than ever before. Watching first galaxies came together. Surprisingly, astronomers found galaxies that seemed much more mature than expected, much earlier than it was believed possible. What's going on and what does this mean for cosmology? And we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. Your internet glitched and you're now out of sync. And we're back. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing I can do about this. Okay. Am I I'm still recording, right? No. Weird. Your system glitched. Why would it stop recording? Okay, I let me don't see one. Okay, hold on. <laughs> like just as you went into the the intro, it glitched. Huh. We're having all the technological issues today, folks. Like I came down and my computer had been like, I shall crash. And then I rebooted it and it was like, no camera for you. 
so I had to figure out I think my camera working. And uh, neither of us can get to Google Drive, and now this. Why am I not able to hear this? Robert Westerbrock has raised an interesting question. I wonder if a really good ventriloquist could pretend their audio was out of sync. Huh, so I stopped at the, okay, all right, all right. Everything is, everything is okay. So I'm gonna restart from here. Hmm, okay, let's do this as part one. Apologize in advance editor are you on the same microphone because your audio also got a lot softer yeah uh hold on i'll make sure like i wonder and an airplane is going over um let me see okay did that change anything? No. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll go with that. Oh, wait, hold on. listen to it for a second just to make sure it's the right one how far it gets into Best show ever. <laughs> I think our equipment went on vacation without us. Okay, so I need to... Okay, I need to redo my intro. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for catching that. I, would have, I wouldn't even have noticed. And then, then we would have had to pull this audio out of the YouTube, YouTube. video. Which is one of the reasons why we do this, is to yes. give us a back. All right, let me start my recording. One of JWST's top jobs is to peer deeper into the universe than ever before, watching as the first galaxies came together. Surprisingly, astronomers found galaxies that seemed much more mature than expected, much earlier than it was believed possible. What's going on? And what does this mean for cosmology? And we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. So I guess I'm trying to think, okay, so like, why is JWST so good for this job? Why is it the perfect machine for seeing early into the universe? Well, it, it's that whole infrared thing that we're just going to keep bringing up over and over and over. Light from young stars is peaking in the ultraviolet, but because the universe is expanding, and the further away you look, the more stuff there is between us and that to be expanding. We see the most distant parts of our universe as moving very fast away from us, which shifts all that ultraviolet light all the way through visible and into the infrared, where it's easily apparent to the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, the thing is that there's the other side of this, which is you need something with high resolution cameras because right now our best way, not our only way, but our best way of imaging these things is to look at galaxy clusters that uh, use their mass to bend light towards us that otherwise would have gone to other parts of the universe. And that added light from the bent light uh, magnifies the brightness of these distant objects but we need the high resolution and we still need the light gathering power of the massive mirror of JWST to make out those faint smudges of light that are getting gravitationally lensed. 
So, so the galaxies that we're seeing, these ones, these impossible galaxies that we'll talk yeah. about in a second, they're being seen thanks to the gravitational lensing or yeah. is JWST able to just see some of these just with its raw capability? It's, it's capable of seeing it through the raw capability, but we first started seeing them and we have seen the largest number of them so far through this gravitational lensing. It's, it's basically the low hanging fruit. It takes fewer orbits and you can honestly get a whole lot more science mm -hmm. for the hour if you look at a galaxy cluster because you get the galaxy cluster and you get everything that's in the background of the galaxy cluster. So right. by the numbers, right. that's how we've seen the most of them. And it's almost like the first time they turned this on, they found a bunch of these really big galaxies and they're studying them, but there are deeper, like all skies, well, not all sky surveys, but no. deep field surveys like what happened with the Hubble Space Telescope in yes. the works. Yes. That hopefully we'll see a lot more of this kind of stuff and get a better sense of like a, like a survey of them as opposed to seeing the low hanging fruit, the weird stuff right away. And the stuff that was lucky, lucky enough, I don't know if that's the right word, we were lucky enough, uh, yeah. was aligned to allow gravitational lensing. That That's one of the, the statistical frustrations is if you look at a mostly empty patch of the sky, like they did with the Hubble Deep Field, like they're now doing with the JVST Deep Field, and you look and you look and you look and you look, you can say, in this volume of space, which is a cone that increases as you look back, there is this population visible. And, and it's a by volume measurement of what's visible as a function of brightness. So you're not going to see the faintest stuff furthest out, but you're still going to know in that volume of space what is typically going to be seen. Now, with, with JWST, they're looking at galaxies that just happen to be oriented just right behind these clusters that their light that in some cases originated just a few hundred million years after the big bang their light has been bent our way and we're not necessarily seeing their neighbors their neighbors didn't necessarily have all the right geometry right. so it's it's not that same careful volume limited statistical sample and what were they expecting to see like i'm sure as they they probably spent more time building models, trying to yeah. make expectations, figure out their calibration before they took those first images. What was sort of the the default astronomical expectation of what they would see? So, so what we're guilty of always doing is looking at the cosmic microwave background, which is the rabbit hole we shall not go down. Mm -hmm and looking at the modern universe and figuring out what had to happen to get from the distribution of little tiny, uh, denser and less dense distribution in the cosmic microwave background to our current large scale structure. And we make assumptions about, okay, so if you have this mix and you have dark matter that has this temperature and you see this happening at this point in the universe and this happening at this point in the universe, then in the section of universe we know nothing about in time, right. these things must have happened. Right. And, and so we made assumptions based largely on the distribution of hot and cold patches in the cosmic microwave background. And we expected that there would be a very small number of large-ish galaxies forming that resembled the distribution of hotter spots in the cosmic microwave background. We figured there'd be a whole lot of itty bitty little tiny stuff that was more matching the, the average distribution of warmer spots in the cosmic microwave background. So, so astronomers look at the cosmic microwave background, they see these warmer spots they yeah. correspond to denser regions of the early universe the place where you'd expect large amounts of mass to come together yeah. and then you calculate the number of hot spots versus the number of cold spots and that tells you about what the mixture of big galaxies to small galaxies should be because those hot spots big spots are going to turn into big galaxies while the less dense but you can, obviously it's not a one-to-one -one right correlation because 
you can't see like what that part of the cosmic microwave background radiation turned into. Yeah. It's a different time. It's yeah. you're, you're seeing simultaneously one part of the universe that is older that you're seeing a different place. And so it's like a statistically you see one thing over here and that allows you to expect what you might see over on this other part of, and, the, of the sky. And we base a whole lot off of this, this general idea that the universe looked at at a large enough scale and averaged is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. So as long as you look at a big enough chunk, each big enough chunk will have the same amount of stuff and the same population of stuff in it, just like grabbing a cup of sand at different points on the beach, you're going to have the same distribution of grains. One might end up with a glass bobble in it. One might end up with a dead crab in it. Right. But, yeah. but more or less, you will have the same distribution in each cup full right. of universe as cup full of sand. It's like fishing in Stardew Valley, right? You just keep fishing. Yeah. You're going to get lots of the one kind of fish, and then every now and then you'll get the rare kind of fish. Yeah. You just keep at it and the statistics will start to pile up. Um, so, okay. You know, actually, we're going to take a break. Okay. And we're back. So then, okay. So they had this sort of expectation like this based on the density, over density regions of the early universe. This is the kind of structure, large scale structure of the universe that we should see. Mm -hmm. What did they see? Well, <sighs> First, they saw some really big things, and they're like, yeah, those are easy to see, statistics. It's, it's all right. We're still okay here. And then they kept looking, and they kept seeing really big stuff. Right. And it started to hit the point where it was just like, okay, so there is something clearly wrong with our theories or with what we expected dark matter to be or with all of the above because – there are more large things and the cosmic microwave background seems able to support. So what is going on? Right. And like literally the entire astronomical community had a moment of, oh dear, or excitement, pick one. But it was, it was a moment of emotion for all of us. Right. But so, I mean, when, when they saw them, yeah. it's like, these could be like a complete fluke that we just yeah. happened to see a part of the, we, you know, but we, we kept seeing sticker, more of them. We, we kept happening. You know, we kept putting our, our hand in the water and we kept pulling out dead crabs. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a chance that you could keep pulling out dead crabs, but you'd yeah. expect to pull out just empty seawater every now and then or rocks or, or yeah, or, yeah a little bit of seaweed. So, so then what could be going on that would give you these these larger galaxies than expected? So people started reaching for all the different tools in the cosmological tool bag. There was the, well, maybe dark matter had a different temperature than we thought and cold dark matter is dead, which confused me deeply because if you make it colder, then you end up with more big things. There was dark matter is not what we thought it was at all arguments. There was, well, maybe there was just more stuff or maybe things aren't where we thought because we're not understanding the spectra right. There was a whole lot of it's, it can't possibly be where we think we're seeing things. And in a few cases, that was the, the actual answer. And then the theorists with the big computers got involved and started rerunning their models with greater granularity. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things that I'm really enjoying watching what happens with everything from weather models to plate tectonics to cosmological models is it used to be we thought we were doing awesome when we modeled a galaxy with 10,000 points of matter to see how it evolved right. and yeah when a star can have when a galaxy can have 100 billion stars right in it. not to and, mention distribution of gas and dust and dark and matter dust and dark matter and globular clusters and yeah and rogue planets and black holes and influences from nearby galaxies so 
theorists started doing the, okay, so what happens if we increase the granularity of our models? What happens if we have a mix of hot and cold dark matter? What happens if, and we started seeing some of the more wild explanations for what is causing dark energy, in my opinion, um, where we saw folks working on models for things like, what if dark energy is a function of black holes so there wasn't dark energy prior to there being black holes and we don't know what the truth is but mm -hmm. one of the remarkable things that is happening is we are seeing more and more computer models capable of saying yeah I it looks like we can get there from here it looks like the temperature on average that we thought was dark matter is actually the temperature of the dark matter just maybe it's built up of more constituents and and so you have the folks in the middle going it's not what we expected but it doesn't ruin our understanding of the universe you have the folks that are jubilant on the other side going the universe is totally different yeah everything is bigger than it should be it's texas but in space they don't actually say that that's just what came right. into my yeah. head um and then you have on the other side the people who are like physics is weird we have found weird physics we are going to change our understanding of physics mm -hmm. And, and I have to admit, I'm one of the people that is sitting on the sideline going, more data, please. Yeah, more data, please. I mean, this is like any one of those possibilities yeah. is exciting. Yeah. Right? That, um, you know, these new computer simulations, and I, you know, we did a couple of stories on this on, on Universe Today. Like they, like in the past, they've, they've simulated fairly large chunks of the universe at a lower resolution. And instead, they they were able to make you know, some some of the most powerful supercomputers on Earth a very detailed simulation of a very small part of the universe and found that the kinds of galaxies that are turning up in this data are are fit within yeah. the the way the universe might have behaved. Or the models could be wrong, right? Like like, you know, I mean models are just models. And so maybe the, the but at least you're starting to make constraints like the most right. out there ideas you can sort of go no it, you know dark matter can't have this temperature mm -hmm. nope uh galaxies couldn't have formed this like you can start to put some constraints and then you have this playing space in between and then as you say right it could be new physics which yeah. is great like can you imagine if there if that if there were new way like if, if dark matter is a combination of forces that if it is different than anyone ever expected that the universe was accelerating at different rates at different times that there are different compositions of the universe at different like this is all great this would yeah. all be wonderful um so however it turns out it's so early that all you can do is just keep gathering information it might be that we're going to look at you know after the fifth jwst ultra deep field has been released the huge swaths of the sky have been mapped down and the survey of galaxies is is really well understood but we're just we're not there yet and so it's just it's too early to say anything about anything ever. and what's super cool though is folks are starting to look in all the different wavelengths i mean some wavelengths are just not going to be useful gamma rays you can't really study the early universe in gamma rays because the gamma rays have shifted to something else but we are in an age where we have meerkat coming online, where we have uh, within imaginable future, the square kilometer array, we're starting to build bigger and bigger optical systems. And the way things work in astronomy is you need some piece of data to say, it is worth it to give me time on this super expensive limited resource telescope to explore this idea. With, without that fragment of data, you can't get the time. Yeah. Well, JWST, quite by accident, is getting amazing results saying, yeah, we need to look at this a little bit closer, which is opening the door to use some of these other limited resource systems to look deeper and deeper and deeper and try and understand across the wavelengths just what was going on. And I am 
really looking forward to the suite of telescopes that we're going to have 10 years from now, where we start seeing mm. early results from Square Kilometer Array, where we're starting to get results from the LSST, and where JWST has had enough time on orbit to start completing some of these deep fields and then doing the follow-up observations. Right now, we're not entirely sure what's going on other than we keep seeing really big things that seem mm. to be in the first few hundred million years of the universe, maybe, we think, and they're big. We're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So I, I don't know, did you hear the most recent turn of this story? So like it had been like JWST finds galaxies that are too big too soon and yeah. then and then uh then there was a correction to the distance and then it was wait then there was a no wait we have these other four galaxies yeah, these models. are truly that far away yeah and then yeah so we've confirmed that's exactly right yeah and then and then the these models say no actually these are perfectly well yeah fit within the distribution data that you would expect nothing bizarre going on here and the latest twist and turn is is that some researchers went through and carefully examined the images and and think that those galaxies might be three to ten times more massive holy than originally Batman. believed yeah yeah right so and there's just like it's such a mess right now yeah. it's this, this, this exciting wonderful mess with with just this sort of it's like this renaissance well, of, time, of, of, dis of discovery with you know like because JWC is just this fire hose of data that's just being you know barfed out onto the table and astronomers are trying to pick through it and make sense of it and the and the most data is basically through a carnival mirror which is what's yes. partially right. making this so difficult yeah using gravitational lensing which is could not be harder. No, no. Yeah. I mean, you, you can imagine, we, we talked a couple episodes back about the, the ultra diffuse, low luminosity galaxies. And the, these are systems that are big and splooged out and have like 10 to 100 times fewer stars than our galaxy over the same volume of space. And we can see that because we can directly image and image and image and image to see that splooge. Mm -hmm. Now, if you looked at this through a carnival mirror, it might get contracted in one direction, spread out in the other. And you're trying to work backwards to figure out what that was. And all you know is how much light there is, not what the original distribution of that light was. And so you might end up working out, oh, that was just like a normal dwarf galaxy instead of this spread out volume of light. Trying to reverse engineer geometry when you don't totally yeah. understand the, the gravity of the situation, by which I mean the literal gravity of that Pardon intervening galaxies. Yeah, pun intended. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I think... Like right now, we are right in the middle of one of these mysteries, and it's one of these things that that five year, when we do our five year, what happened to those possible galaxies episode? Yeah, in you know in, around episode one thousand, um, we will be able to come back around and go. Oh, turns out this is what it was, and now we have a really good concrete information. It turned out to be this, or. It turned out to be that the Lambda CDM model has been completely overturned. Right. And, and now we're in completely brand new territory. We are in, you know, the unpleasant, not even unpleasant, like the exciting discovery of the quantum mechanics, right? Like nobody ordered yeah. quantum mechanics. Nobody no. thought that that's how the universe worked. No. And yet it does deal with it. And, uh, and this is where we could be going next. And Very just exciting. since we added this episode to the calendar, the field has changed four times. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we planned this episode three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. And at, at that point, we knew that there were definitely four galaxies in the first few hundred million years that were incontrovertibly large. Yeah. And then everything else has happened since then. Yeah. So crazy. So fun. I love it. 
I can't wait to see where this goes next. It's just like, to, I always use the analogy of like you're watching a sports game or like a mystery movie and you don't know the outcome and you're there for the, for the game. You're there for the reason and the sort of You glitched again, are you still moments. recording? I'm okay, yeah, I'm still okay. okay. Yeah, you're there for the for those exciting moments and and you don't know how the whole thing is going to turn out. And we're right now today in mid 2023, we are in this moment and I love it. So thank you, Pamela. And thank you. And thank you to everyone out in our audience who makes this show possible through your patronage over at patreon.com. And all of you get ad free episodes as a benefit. Um, we, we can't thank all of you during our episodes, but this week I would like to thank Boy Andre Livesvoll, Gerhard Schweitzer, or Schwaritzer. I'm sorry. Uh, David, Amy Zhang, Zero Chill, Astrosets, Paul F., Andrew Stevenson, Alex Rain, Paul L. Hayden, Sam Brooks, and his mom. Bart Flaherty, Brian Kelby, Stephen Coffey, Philip Walker, Nate Detweiler, Benjamin Carrier, The Air Major, The Lonely Sand Person, Planetar, Lou Zealand, Mansky, Sammy Rassian, uh, John Drake, uh, Gabriel Galfin, Dean, uh, Glenn McDavid, Nyla, Sean Matz, Benjamin Davies, Ninja Nick, Jason Cardukas, Robert Hundle, uh, Kim Barron, Paul Esposito, Bob Zatsky, Arthur Latz Hall, Ron Thorson, Jordan T Turner, Hal McKinney, Zebra Lark, Bruno Latz, Jimmy Berger, Ron, Ruben McCarthy, Ian Abdullah, uh, Abdella, Jeff McDonald and Lee Harborn. And thank you all for tolerating my mispronunciation of your names week after week. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. And then they saved. Four dash two. Okay. My dogs have been named Lee Hounds of Astronomy. Lee Hounds? What's a Lee Hound? As, as in, like, the hounds, but in French. Oh. I do not speak French at all. Um. Lay in this case because it would be multiple. Yes. Got it. Uh, but I am not going to trot out my French ever. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Appel Fraser. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we uh, all all Canadians have a terrible sort of educational level of French forced upon us. And then some lucky ones went to like French immersion school. And then of course, all the people in Quebec who yeah, were yeah. mostly bilingual and showing us all up. <laughs> um, all right. So let's uh, chip into some questions here. So Arjun asks, what? I was about to bring one in from Twitch, but go ahead. Okay. Arjun asks, what do bigger galaxies then mean for us now? Does it mean galaxies grew slowly after the epoch that we are looking at now? So this is the question. If you had massive galaxies forming back then, theoretically, they would be the seeds of galaxy clusters like what we see with Coma and Virgo. And those massive systems would have continued to evolve, becoming the central CD galaxies. But the the number that we are we are finding we're still trying to figure out if it can evolve to match what we see locally and one of the real problems that we run into and this is a stupid problem brought on by the speed of light is we can only see a small volume of now because as we look further and further away it becomes then and and so to get a large sampling volume we have to look 
back in time. And so trying to figure out what is the modern distribution of rare objects always becomes a bit of a challenge. Mm. Um, and, and the truly massive clusters are, we believe, more rare. So it's complicated. <laughs> right. Um, you had one on Twitch. Yes. Uh, so Robert Westbrook asks, how do astronomers map in three dimensions the gravitational fields around these distant objects, looking at radial velocities or things in the field of view? It is a combination. So when we look at these massive uh, galaxy clusters, we know that they're not necessarily spherical. They're lumpy, bumpy. They're potato shaped. There's a lot of potatoes in space. In this case, it's potato distribution in galaxies. So we will see a, a, a distribution on the sky that is denser in the center and gets less dense as it moves out. And we make assumptions about the three-dimensional shape of all of that, taking into account the radial velocities, where the velocity we measure coming towards us and away from us is due to the orbit and the total mass of the system. So by looking at the system and going, okay, the average velocity profile is this, and I see these differences in profile, you can start to get at a three-dimensional structure for the whole thing. Um, it all comes down to being very grateful that light gets redshifted and blue shifted and things are on orbits. Right. Um... There is a request for a children's book called Lumpy Bumpy Galaxies. Lumpy Bumpy Galaxies. Arjun also asks, does this take into account the fact that the stars may be larger? So are they big? I mean, only the large stars were the pop three stars. And right. They were pre-galaxy, really. Right. They... So they would have existed in higher distributions in the places that first formed massive galaxies. And so you can say that they were lighting up proto galaxies. And, and there's a few papers talking about that. Yeah. Um, so, so the first generation of massive stars formed in proto galaxies, blue bubbles broke through with ultraviolet light, quasars lit up, broke through with ultraviolet light. Things exploded, broke through with ultraviolet light, reionized the universe. Exactly how all of that played out, we will know more once we get the first deep fields from the JWST. Uh, Ulan Kulu asks, how does dark matter cool? I mean, shed energy to be able to clump. So the idea is that dark matter came in a colder variety initially. So it's more a matter of it doesn't have to cool off. It's just gravity is allowing more to compact in different places and holding on to it. So as you turn up the amount of mass in a given gravitational well, that increased mass can hold on to the same distribution of velocities, dark matter. Right. Um... Obsidian Radio has a theory for the universe. The universe might not be expanding at all. Instead, it might be growing like plants, roots, or branches. Each section grows at its own rate, and the main things that cause galaxies, stars, planets to form and grow is electromagnetism and plasma. So, so there's the study state theory that existed in the 50s? It was like the main uh, alternative to the Big Bang. Or I yeah. Guess it was the considered before the big bang like the big bang was considered the you know i would assume yeah. The universe was static. yeah so so the problem is that with steady state physics you don't get the cosmic microwave background right and so if if you had like you're sort of imagining these branches going out they would have a shape to them that wouldn't match the cosmic microwave background yeah. because we see it in all directions yeah yeah yeah. I mean, like, like any theory that anyone comes up with for the universe has to, has to 
explain the cosmic microwave background radiation that it is a black body that matches the characteristic of the, the entire waves. universe yeah and the entire universe being this one temperature so it's not like if you had pinpoint stars or galaxies it would give a very different look than the black body radiation of the cosmic microwave background so you've got to explain the entire universe being about 3000 degrees kelvin 3000 kelvin don't don't at me, bro. Um, and then <laughs> you've got to be able to explain the helium, hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, beryllium lithium abundances yeah. as ratios. You've got to explain the uh, th the amount of clumping of the large scale structures of the universe at various ages of the universe. And you've got to explain the fact that everything is moving away from us. The farther it is, the faster it's moving away from us. Yeah. And like, and so any theory that you have for the universe, you've got to like at the very like basics, you've got to get those four observations explained. Yeah. And so it's like, if you're like, well, I don't know how, then you're not ready. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're just not ready to 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 roll your theory out on the rest of the on on other people. Because you've got to go like, what about the cosmic microwave background? You're like, oh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Look, here's the math. My theory perfectly matches the cosmic microwave background radiation. Well, how do we get the heavier elements? Oh, here. Here, my theory perfectly yeah. predicts that with math. And <clears throat> it makes one additional prediction. Right. That, you know, that if you. You need something to differentiate. Right. My and that's theory where string predicts... theory goes wrong well yeah in that it can't it be predicts observed. nothing right well I, I mean it makes i mean in theory it makes predictions if you could observe them at that level so um so that's all so so and, and then you can make this this the your the one improvement you say and if you feed a black cat a white um fish it will <laughs> always poop out a green star <laughs> and and people around the world perform this experiment and they're like i never tried this that is evidence of your theory then yeah. then you're well on track there's a great book and actually i i keep it on my uh counter keep it on my bookshelf it's called the cosmic revolutionaries handbook and it's by uh joint lewis i don't know if you ever talked to joint lewis he's terrific no from Australia. And so the gist is like, so you've got a better idea for the Big Bang. So you figured out the 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 way to like, great, great news, right? Because we need that theory. Someone, yeah. please give us that theory. But here are all the pitfalls. Here's here's all the ways that people up until this point have failed to to deliver the goods because either they didn't have the capability to think through they they didn't have the mathematical expertise to to sort of help show how their their theory explains the universe as we yeah. see it right you can't hand wave away you know the cosmic microwave background all right here's a question that i would love to know why these two particular particles were picked um a dreamless phantom asks, can antimatter form when a neutron absorbs a very high energy neutrino? So, so first off, neutrinos really hate to interact with anything. It's just not something they like to do. So if you were able to conf confine a neutron, which has no charge, so does not like to be confined, and a neutrino just right so that they collided absorb i mean they're, they're particles so absorbing isn't the right phrase mm -hmm. they would they would become energy and then you would end up with inevitably one major thing coming out and then a particle antiparticle coming out so that's that's just like what happens when you slam things together um, particles and antiparticles exist all the time. What mm -hmm. is the reason that we don't constantly see these antimatter explosions out of some Dan Brown novel is you have to have just the right 
particle antiparticle to come together to go back into being pure energy. Right. Robert Westerbrook phrased it as it's Goldilocks neutrino. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Renan Geo 6 is asking, are there any studies regarding the distribution of stellar populations on those early galaxies, specifically regarding formation of smaller dwarf stars forming on that stage and the impact in the overall galaxy mess? We so, wish. so, so what we understand right now is, um, because they didn't have heavy metals that would allow them to radiate energy effectively, the very first stars were massive balls of hydrogen and helium. They lived brief lives, they exploded, they spewed heavy, heavy, heavier elements everywhere that got mixed into future generations. With these heavier elements in there, it was easier for stars to cool off. Um, and, and so you didn't end up with massive stars forming the same way. And, and so this then raises the question of, well, what was the mass distribution of population two stars? And we talk about this in terms of the initial mass function. What is the ratio of the biggest to the smallest and everything in between? And we have no idea. I mean, we have ideas. We just don't know which ones are right. Yeah. I mean, like... I feel like it's kind of like saying like, like you see elephants and you're like, yeah, but, but you know, what is the diet of those elephants? What is the, what is the, you know, what's in their poop? What, what yeah. are the birds that are clustered around those elephants? And you're like, all we can see is elephant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're over there. See those things? Those are elephants. Yeah. yeah we yeah, but like, how are their, what's the quality condition of their toenails? Like, I right. don't know. We, we do our best by looking and saying, okay, so we see this total distribution of light. Can we then match that distribution of light by assuming different ratios of stars? Yeah. But that's not the most specific way to do things. Right. Yeah. I mean, to be able to pick out individual stars in those galaxies would be... We can't. Yeah. That'd be so great. Uh, Googler says, does the cosmos spin slower as it expands? We don't know. I mean, conservation I'm of angular momentum says it should, but like, does it? it what frame right. of reference are we spinning relative to? Right. I mean, it's... It, like, that's the heart of the question, right? Yeah. Is, that, is there a universal frame of reference? Right. Einstein says, no. Right. So... So does a person who is rotating around, you know, traveling through the universe experience a rotating cosmos? Yes. Do you, when you spin on your chair, you experience <laughs> a rotating cosmos, yes. right? So, but there is no like belief that the, the universe itself is spinning from some exterior perspective. Yeah. Um, People said rant over. <laughs> had I had I ranted? Not um, really. Rant away. There you go. Uh, not really. No, that was a very that was a very low. That was factual. Rare. That mm. was that was a. Let me explain to you how to get your theory believed mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, I mean, like. Okay, here comes. I feel rant returning. Um, <laughs> like people think. That astronomers are not open to new ideas. Yeah. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Very true. That astronomers widely recognize that they don't have all the answers. Yeah. They just don't know where to go next because nobody has, has produced a theory that matches all the existing observations and makes predictions that can be checked. Um, and I'm going to use an analogy here. It's like, have you ever had a, like a screw that you're trying to undo and you don't have the tool? Yeah. Like you just don't have that tool. It's like a yeah. one of those pentabits or something like that. Yeah. That yeah. You need for the back of your iPhone. And, and so you're like, 
you're trying to open this thing and you're like, I can't open the back of my iPhone. And then your friend goes, have you tried the Robertson? And you're like, yeah, it does it. it's the wrong shape. Have you tried the Phillips? Y- yeah, I've tried the Phillips. It's the wrong yeah. shape. Have you tried the flathead? Yes. So I need the, I need the one with five. Have you tried yeah. the Robertson? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I tried the Robertson. Right. And then you, you, know, you call, he calls her friend over. Friend goes, oh, you tried a Phillips yet? Yes. Yeah, I tried yeah. a Phillips. Right. And um, we have all. Have you tried a banana? We all get exhausted by this, although. Yeah, have you tried a, have you tried a banana? <sighs> no, but I'm pretty sure a banana does not meet the qualifications for what we're trying to do here. Yeah, um, it's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's it. That's it. Like, like that either the idea that's being proposed has already been thought of and then f- didn't survive that process of, of gathering, you know, of, of explaining the existing, like, like a, an astronomer who did and do all the math said, Oh, wait a minute. What if the universe is actually shrinking? And then they do all the math and they go, Oh wait, nope, that doesn't explain the cause of the Yeah. Right. Okay. Rejected. Right. And, It, someone is someone is suggesting something that just like isn't even speaking the same language like yeah but what if it's like there's like this universal chakra that is connecting all consciousness and you're like can you can you put that into a mathematical formula please right yeah yeah it's like love plus consciousness equals universe yeah no uh what you know what units are you using for love is that in is that in heartbeats per fond thought or is that it you know yeah. it's consciousness right so anyway that's and so that's it that's the heart of it and so if if you're if if you want to solve this problem astronomers would love to hear it uh, and there's a Nobel Prize waiting for you yeah. to do it. Yeah. And millions of dollars and and a seat beside Einstein and Newton and in the annals of history. You just have to not bring a Robertson screwdriver or a banana to iPhone disassembly. And remember to publish with only one other co-author because only two of you can get the Nobel Prize. And what I love is how frequently you can tell the papers where they're like, we want the Nobel Prize because there's only two authors. Right. Um, Yeah. It's one of my favorite things to watch for. Such a dumb rule. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is why there's the Gruber Prize. It can go to the entire research team. Yeah. Uh, All right. We've reached the end of our show, so thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. <laughs> thank you, Pamela, for bringing the brain. Uh, thank you to all of the moderators. Thank you in advance to the editors and producers who are going to deal with this nonsense that we're <laughs> hurling your way, this auditory vomit. Um, uh, and thank you to everyone who asked questions in the chat. That was a lot of fun today. All right. And and thank you, Fraser, for once again bringing all the ranty goodness and excellent (laughs) questions and the knowledge that there could be leather bike grips out there. Yeah. Or cork. Yeah. The cork is mixed with rubber. I looked that up while you were ranting. What about, what about leather around cork? Hmm. Um, So people are going to have to come to grips emotionally. There's only four more episodes. And then we're on summer hiatus. Yes. Summer hiatus. So plan like fun summertime now that you don't have to watch us every couple of days. It's true. Which is, you know, mandatory, obviously. (laughs) Um, I know I will. All right. I'm going to go pick up the chainsaw and get back to work. I'm going to go clean my house. All right.